All right. Good morning, church. It is good to see you again. And, and here we find ourselves um, uh, separated again by by distance, but yet we are we are united together by spirit and by God's word. And um, we just pray that you guys are, are healthy and safe. And and we look forward to just fel- or fellowship and worshiping together tonight. Before we begin, I want to read a, a passage of scripture from Psalms uh, nine or fifty nine for us. Uh, starting in verse 16, it says, But I will sing of your strength, I will sing aloud of your steadfast love in the morning. For you have been to me a fortress and a refuge in the day of my distress. O oh, my strength, I will sing praises to you, for you, O oh God, are my fortress, the God who shows me steadfast love. Let's go ahead and pray before we get started today. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your steadfast love. Lord, that we could run to you in the time of need, in the time of, of worry, in the time of stress, Lord, that we can come and just cast all of our anxieties upon you and find rest in you, our fortress. Lord, we thank you for this evening. We thank you for the time that we're going to share together uh, through your word and through song and fellowship, Lord, as we watch this tonight or this morning. Father, we, we praise you that we can even be, begin doing this. Lord, we want to give this time to you. It's your time, Father. We just pray that that this morning you'll be honored and gloried, glorified through our time together in fellowship and song. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us this morning. I heard an old, old story How a Savior came from glory, how he gave his life on Calvary to save a wretch like me. I heard about his groaning, of his precious blood's atoning. Then I repented of my sins and won the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus. My Savior forever, He sought me and He bought me with His redeeming love. He loved me ere I knew Him, and all my love is to Him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. I heard about his healing, and his cleansing power revealing, how he made the lame to walk again, and caused the blind to see. And then I cried, dear Jesus, come and heal my broken spirit. And somehow Jesus came and brought to me the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and he bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is to him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. Mansion. I heard about a mansion he has built for me in glory. And I heard about the streets of gold beyond the crystal sea. About the angels singing and the old redemption story. And some sweet day I'll sing up there song of victory oh victory in jesus my savior forever he sought me and he bought me with his redeeming love he loved me ere i knew him and all my love is to him he plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. He loved me. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is to him. He plunged 
Change me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. Amen. The love of God is greater far than tongue or pen can ever tell. It goes beyond the highest star and reaches to the lowest hell. The guilty pair bow down with care. God sent His Son to win His erring child. He reconciled and pardoned from His sin. When years of time shall pass away and earthly kings and kingdoms fall, when men who hear refuse to pray on rocks and hills and mountains call, God's love so sure shall still endure all measureless and strong redeeming grace to Adam's race the saints and angels song Could we with ink the oceans fill and were the skies of parchment made were every sigh on earth the quill and every man a tribe by trade to write the love of God above would drain the ocean dry. Nor could the scroll contain the whole, though stretched from sky to sky. Thank you, God. Thank you that your love is so sure, and so true, so pure and full, Lord. Thank you that we could spend our lives trying to explain it, trying to write, Lord, trying to show all the things that you've done, and that will fail. We'll fail to show it in its entirety. God, there's not a book on earth that could contain all of your wonders. No way we could fully explain it, fully understand it. But God, we can know that it's true. We can know that it's sure. We can know that its promises are real. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for bringing us here. Thank you that we can worship you. Even though we're far apart, thank you that we're together. Lord, I pray that you would bless Duba, his sermon. Lord, that you would help us to have understanding. 
Fill us with wisdom, Lord. We love you so much. Pray that you'd be with us today. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, well, good morning, church. I'm glad that we could do this, uh, gather together, even though you are in your own homes. And apart from each other, we're able to, on some level, be unified around the word, around the same passage of scripture together. And in song, as we, as we do this, um, I would just encourage you to uh, focus in on, on what we're going to look at here in Philippians chapter 2. We're going to be concluding the rest of this chapter today. And uh, so open your Bibles, tap your screens open to Philippians chapter 2. We're going to start in ni- verse 19 and then finish the, uh, finish the chapter. But before we get into that, uh, let me pray and then we will uh, we'll jump right into this. Uh, Lord, I am grateful that we could gather together here. Uh, even though we're apart, we can still be unified and Uh, As we spend time going through your word, I pray that you would speak through me. Uh, The things that I say would be from you and uh, really what's on your heart. That the words of this passage this morning, uh, though it seems simple and straightforward, that you would teach us uh, just about the power of, of what's written here, the power of love for one another, and the power of the gospel as well. In your name, amen. Well, uh, as, we, as we jump into this passage, a couple things I just want to remind you of. Uh, we have been going through this, this book, and as we've been going through that, the theme of the book has been for the sake of the gospel. And oftentimes when we go through this book, uh, or when others go through this book, the subject is joy. And we see joy woven through this book just in a beautiful way by Paul. And, and what we see as well is the joy that Paul has is not simply because uh, he's worked really, really hard and he's just working every day to be more joyful, but rather he is joyful because of the gospel and being able to share the gospel with people. And uh, as we look even at chapter one, chap- earlier in chapter one and chapter two as well, we have, we've seen how Paul really loves the church in Philippi, a church that he planted some time ago. Paul is currently in prison, uh, but we know he loves this, this people and he wants them to strive towards moving the gospel forward in their community uh, that desperately needs Jesus. Uh, before we get started, I want to ask you a couple of questions, really a, a short test here. Uh, and I know I didn't say test before, but a quick test, some things I want you to think about, some questions uh, just to spin around in your head. So answer them in your head, uh, and they will connect back to our passage today. So five questions, answer them in your head. The first question is this, can you name five of the wealthiest people on earth? Five of the wealthiest people, think about that. How about this? Can you name the last five Super Bowl winning teams? Just the last five. How about the last three winners of Miss America? Something that, you know, beauty being something that we just idolize so much in our culture, that being the pinnacle of it, can you name the last three winners? How about this? The fourth question, the last three teams who won the NBA. Some of you are now tuned in and thinking about these things. Some of you are pulling your phones out and Googling the answers to some of these things. I would encourage you, don't, don't do that. Listen to this last question. How about the last three winners of the Nobel Peace Prize? You can check on these answers later. Something as prestigious as that, it's interesting how we can so easily forget who those people are. So here's a little bit easier of some questions. Uh, five questions that I think you will answer because they're more specific to each and every one of you. Can you name a few teachers who help you through your journey in school? Just a few. How about this? Can you name three friends who stood with you through a difficult time? Just three. Maybe you can name more. But as you think about that, maybe name some people in your head. I'm sure every one of us has some different people. Third question, name five people who taught you something worthwhile that impacts your life even today. How about this? Can you name five people that you enjoy spending time with? Maybe there's only five people. I don't know. But five people that you enjoy spending time with. I'm sure that some people are coming to your mind right now. The last of these five questions, name some heroes 
who have inspired you, the stories of heroes who have inspired you. Maybe you know them, maybe you don't, but they're specific to you that brought inspiration to you. I'm sure with that second set of questions, that, that those five questions specifically about you, you understand uh, how it uh, is, is true more about you and you'll remember some of those names more so than something like the wealthiest people or the winners of those uh, awards or games. The point is this, the people who matter to us are not the ones with the most trophies or wealth or beauty, but rather those who make the most impact on our lives are those who cared the most in our lives. I still remember personally people, even Awana leaders that I had when I was 10 years old. I don't know where they are today, but I remember the interactions that I had with them because they cared about about me. So no matter how strong you are, we all need friends. Even Paul needed friends. And in our passage today, we are going to see two friends that really Paul uh, cares a lot about. A little backdrop on this passage before we jump into it is this. Uh, We see from chapter one and the beginning of chapter two, how Paul really emphasizes the, the power of the gospel, but also how important it is that we humble ourselves, that we get pride out of the way, so the gospel can really shine through us. And then he has a couple examples. He has an example of Jesus at the beginning of chapter two, uh, Christ being the example of humility. And then he gives us another example as himself, someone who set aside themselves for the sake of the gospel. And I'm sure Paul's thinking, well, of course, Jesus is a good example. And I'm sure that Paul is a good example, but what about some normal folk? Thus the entitlement of the message today, when ordinary and extraordinary collide. And that's what we see here in this passage. I'm not gonna read through the entire passage. First, we'll walk through it verse by verse together. But we see here that Timothy and Epaphroditus are the two people that we, that we see jumping out from in verse nine, uh, starting verse 19 through verse 24 is the first section of the first paragraph probably in your Bible. And then the second paragraph is verse 25 through 30. And that's when we're looking at Epaphroditus. So open your Bibles if you haven't done so already and we'll look at the first paragraph the first character here. And uh, these are just two normal guys that do extraordinary or have extraordinary uh, lifestyles and character. The first point on your outline and what we can learn from this passage is this. From verses 19 through 22 is to serve people with the mind of Christ. Serve people with the mind of Christ. And we see this with, with Timothy. Timothy, again, another ordinary guy but who's gonna do some extraordinary things. And and just something to jot down um, on this subject is ordinary people become extraordinary when Jesus is in the picture. So Timothy, just an ordinary guy, does some extraordinary things because Jesus is in the picture. The second line there, extraordinary becomes ordinary when Jesus is in the picture. Ordinary people become extraordinary when Jesus is in the picture. Extraordinary becomes ordinary when Jesus is in the picture. So let's look at Timothy here and how he is serving with the mind of Christ and what we can learn from from him. First, we know about Timothy uh, here in, in verse 19. Let's read through this. He says, I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon. So Timothy, we know he's a native of Lystra and Galatia. He has a mom named Eunice, a grandmother named Lois who taught him in the word. What we also know about Timothy is his father was not a God-fearing man. He was a Greek, most likely, uh, you know, he was a Gentile man. We know this because Timothy, we find out, was not circumcised when he uh, started his journeys with Paul. And Paul saw that in Timothy and said, you know what, he knows the scripture because he was trained in that. And he also has a dad who was a Gentile. And Paul, being someone who has had a heart for the Gentiles, said, you know, this pairing might just be perfect for someone joining alongside me. He had a mother who taught him in the scriptures, but a father who was just like the people he's trying to witness to. So a little background on Timothy there. And then it says, so that I too may be cheered or have good comfort by news of you. So he hopes to send Timothy to them. He says, verse 20, for I have no one like him or like-minded Same word in chapter two, verse two, equal in soul is the word here, who will be genuinely concerned for your welfare. Timothy is someone who 
probably planted the church with Paul actually in Philippi. So obviously Timothy would have a care for the church just as Paul would have as well. We go on there in verse 21, and I just want to unpack this a little bit more. He says, for they seek, for they all, whoever they all are, seek their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. And we'll just camp out there for just a moment and ask three questions. First question is, what are the interests of Jesus Christ? What are these interests that we're talking about? The second question, just to spend a little bit of time on is, what, who are all of these other people? Who are these other people that don't share this kind of interest? And then the third question, just to touch on, is, is it always wrong to seek your own interests? So we know about these other people. They all seek their own interests, not the interests of Christ. First, let's ask this question. Who is, or what are the interests of Christ? We see in chapter two, verse four, that we're told by Paul to not, uh, let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. So the not only and also are key there. And when I, I shared a message a few weeks ago, it's not bad to have, to care about yourself, to have interest for yourself, but also it needs to be balanced for interest and care for others. Chapter one, verse eight also speaks about this as well. It says, for God is my witness, how I yearn for you with the affection of Jesus Christ. So what are the interests of Jesus Christ? There's a deep love for other people. It's having interest, having care for other people. And and just think about this line here. We, as believers in Jesus, should live for what Christ died for. We should live for what Christ died for. Let's jump into the second question here. Who are all of these people that we see at the beginning of this verse? Uh, Verse uh, 15 of chapter 1 and verse 17, we see Paul speaking about some other people. Who exactly they are, we're not particularly sure. It says in verse 15 and 17 of chapter 1, some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others of goodwill. So who are some? Who are these some indeed? And then in verse 17, it says, the former, whoever these people are, proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely but thinking to afflict Paul in his imprisonment. And so what we see there are there are some people who are involved in the church, at least involved in the community, who are doing things of their, for their own interest rather than for the interest of Christ. And that's a challenging thing even to think about, even as we serve, and many of you serve in the context of the church or in ministry. Ask yourself, why am I doing this? Am I doing this because it's the right thing to do? Am I doing this because I want to look good to other people and to my family? Am I doing this and believing in this God because um, it, it, it makes me feel like I matter on the inside? Or is it because, as this verse unpacks here, I'm doing this because I care and love about love Jesus and I care about the interests of Christ and so I serve other people because I first and foremost have a love for Jesus? That really should be the defining factor in in how we engage in doing ministry in the church. So verse 21, they all seek their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. Even though you may be looking like on the outside that you're doing work for Christ, the question is this, what's the motivation for that? Your own interests, building yourself up, or the interests of Christ? Let's look at the third question. Is it always wrong to seek your own interests? And, and that's an interesting question. Uh, just a couple of verses. I wrote this down in your outline, in your uh, bulletin outline as well. I hope you've pulled that up. It's in your email that you got this morning. In Mark chapter 8, verses 34 and 35, Jesus speaking, he says this, and calling the crowds to him with his disciples, he said to them, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Well, that, that doesn't sound like doing things your own way, but rather doing it Christ's way. Verse 35 says, for whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my, Jesus speaking, my sake, and the gospels will save it. So how do you really attain uh, working for and having uh, a mindset of glorifying God? Yes, with your interest, but also because of the interest of Christ, it's this, it's loving one another as 1 Corinthians 13 speaks of, it's when, when love does not uh, build itself up, 
It's not about itself. It's not your own interests. As, um, as verse 5 in 1 Corinthians 13 says, uh, it does not behave selfishly. So this idea of, of loving one another is not just about yourself and feeling good, but it's also, uh, and have, seeking your own interests, it's also, how is this going to serve my brothers and sisters in Christ? How is this going to edify them? So to a- answer that question, is it always wrong to seek your own interests? No, it's not always wrong. The question is, is, is seeking your own interests, is it to benefit others or is it just to benefit yourself? Is benefiting others happening in the midst of you doing that? Or is it simply you at the expense? And this is key here. Is it at the expense of others? Are others missing out, losing out, being hurt because you're pursuing your own interests? First Corinthians, I mean, Romans chapter 15, verses one through three, speak about this as well, saying those who are strong ought to... Uh, Uh, that we who are strong have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak, not to please who? Ourselves. So be cognizant of the people around you. Let's continue on from verse 21 to verse 22. But you know Timothy's, here we know, we already know about Timothy, his proven worth. And we see a little bit more about this in in the second part of verse 22. But this idea of proven worth is the same of, of like, he's gone through trials. He's gone through a proving time and shown himself worthwhile in ministry. And this is not just Paul saying this because Paul has trained him and he's not just kind of rubbing his own, you know, dusting off his own shoulders and saying, I'm just that good. And so my protege is just that good. He's saying, no, Timothy's walked alongside me. He's learned from me as we see in verse of uh, the second part of this work, how a father with a son has served me, what? In the gospel. So Timothy has shown his, pr- his worth through serving with Paul. And this idea of a father and a son is not just because it sounds neat, but rather in that culture, a father would, when he has a son, he would train his son up in the trade that he was in. And so all of those people, when, when someone says, as a father with a son, and they're talking about this training, this mentoring kind of relationship. It's one of the son and the father probably sleep in the same house. They're living in the same place. They're doing life together. They're eating meals together. They're asking questions about all sorts of things, even outside of their trade. The father is building up someone to follow after his, whatever his job is, whatever his career is. Um, and so here we have Paul. And look what it says, the second part of verse 22. It's so neat here. He says, he has served with me, not in carpenter work, not in raising cattle, not in, not in shearing sheep, not in working in the temple, but he says this, he has served with me in the gospel. So that's Paul's focus here. Paul's job is in the gospel. And so when it says that Timothy has served as a son with a father, it's saying, Timothy has done life with me as I've been a missionary. Timothy has done life with me as I've been in ministry. And so before we move to the next point, I just want to ask that question to you. Do you need someone to do life with? Are you isolated? Are you, do you find yourself pushed off to the side and no one else coming alongside you to teach you how to do this walk with God? Whatever that means. Like, what does that mean to you, to me? questions that I have about uh, passages of scripture, questions I have about what do I do when I pray about something and God's just not answering me? How do I work through that? How do I work through parenting in this situation? How do I work through a marriage situation like this? How do I go through understanding what being a follower of Jesus really looks like? Do you need somebody else to come alongside and be that person for you? Do you need someone to be a Paul for you? If so, I encourage you, look around you. Look at the people God's put in your life and ask them, be bold. It's scary. I know I've done it. And said, hey, maybe a younger woman, maybe you're an older woman. Age doesn't really necessarily play a part here, but you're looking at someone who's more mature in the faith and said, hey, will you come alongside me? Can we meet and have coffee? every week for a time, maybe a year and do this? Can we go through a book together just to do life together? Can can I text you questions and challenges that I have? Reach out to someone. The the second part of this, and and, and maybe I'm speaking more so to those who um, who are more mature in their faith, 
Maybe you're older. Maybe you've been involved in, in your walk with God longer. I just want to say a word to you. Do you have somebody in your life that is a Timothy to you? Are you discipling somebody else? Are you doing life with somebody else? God has blessed you with an ability to understand the word. Are you blessing somebody else with your understanding of the word? God has blessed you with an ability to to pray deeply with God. Are you blessing somebody else with how to do those same things as well? Who needs you to be a Paul? Who needs you? Who, Who do you need to be a Timothy to? Look for those people. It's kind of scary, I know, but it's, it's so, so powerful. Let's move on to the next point here. Really, we're still in the first section. We'll jump to this next point in your outline in verses 23 and 24, just a short point. I want to draw a nugget out of here. On your outline, you'll see this. God's sovereignty should dictate your plans. God's sovereignty should dictate your plans. And we see this here. It's really neat. Look at some key words there. It says, I hope, this Paul speaking, I hope therefore to send him, just him being Timothy, as soon as I see how it will go with me. And then another, look at the next verse there. And I trust, another important phrase there in the Lord, that shortly, again, no real time frame laid out there, I myself will come also. What I love about this is Paul is not saying, here's my plan and it's gonna go this way. It's really, here's where my heart is and I'm gonna see what God does with it. I desire to build you up. I desire to teach you and train you in the gospel, but I don't know what God's plan is. I'm gonna trust him. Look at those words there. It's it's neat how we see that. As James chapter four, verse 15 mentions, uh, when when James is speaking, he says, don't say I'm gonna go and do this and do this. I'm gonna make these plans and I'm gonna go there, but rather say, if it be the Lord's will, I will do these things. James chapter four, verse 15 speaks about that. You can jot that down as well. Uh, I know that's challenging for us. I know it's challenging for me because I'm a planner. Like I like planning things. I like knowing what's going to happen. Uh, But there's so much of life that we really can't plan. Uh, You know that. This last month and a half, none of us planned that. Not, not one of us. I remember uh, just, uh, actually I was, I was watching a sermon that I was doing earlier at the beginning of this year. And I remember at the beginning, I was just watching it earlier today. I was watching, and it's, I, I said out loud, even as I was standing right here, 2019 was a tough year. I'm sure many of us are looking forward to 2020. And here we are, the third month into 2020, and all of us are like, get it over with. We didn't plan for this. We like to have our plans nailed down. Uh, for me, as a planner, I like to know what's coming That can be challenging even in the midst of leadership because I need to continue to push back on God and say, God, here's where my heart is. What are you gonna do with this? Here's where my heart is. How are you gonna change it? What would you like to do in the midst of this? If Paul went back to Philippi, that's unknown. Some say he did, some say he didn't. Um, But what we see here from Paul is uh, is so, so, so neat. He says, I trust in the Lord. First and foremost, I trust in the Lord. So lessons from that first section uh, is is on your outline, but let's move on to part two here, which is so, so neat. Uh, Lessons, things that we can learn. Verse 25 starts that off. It says, I thought it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier. And he begins to list off some other names for Epaphroditus. But let's just speak about Epaphroditus for just a moment. One, we know he shows up twice. In scripture, all of the New Testament, all of the Bible, two times he shows up. He doesn't have a title like a deacon or an elder or a pastor. Uh, he, he shows up these two times, both of the times in Philippians. And it is interesting too, how sometimes God's choicest servants go unnoticed. Sometimes God's most choice servants go unnoticed. Maybe that's you and you feel like you've been doing a lot but you're unnoticed. Epaphroditus is one of those guys, he shows up a couple times, not much credit is given to him, but here we see five things that Paul says about Epaphroditus that 
is really just neat. And the name Epaphroditus is a unique one. It kind of sounds like a disease, Epaphroditus and all those other itises and stuff. Uh, but Epaphroditus, it comes from the, from the word um, Aphrodite or the goddess of love. And so his name actually means favorite of Aphrodite. And later on, or he was known more as Aphrodite being the goddess of love. His name just became more known as lovely uh, or loving. So this guy, obviously we know from his interactions here with Paul and the church, he loved these people. He was a native of Philippi and a common Greek name that would have come right out of Philippi. So he travels from Philippi, we see from scripture, to bring Paul a gift, a financial gift. He's bringing him money from the church. The church has given a gift and they say, hey, Epaphroditus, can you bring the money from Philippi to Rome for Paul? And and what we see here is that journey from Philippi to Rome is about 800 miles. And a little perspective here, 800 miles is about from Woodland to Spokane, Washington. And Aphrodite, and Epaphroditus, just call him Epaph here. Epaph traveled that journey, not on an interstate, not on like nice paved roads. He may not have even had an animal to ride upon. He was walking that journey. That journey, if he was actually walking it, could have been about six weeks, six week long journey all the way down to bring him that money. And then he's about to travel back. And when he travels back to Philippi, he's going to bring this letter that we're reading right here This letter to the Philippian church is what Epaphroditus carries back. Talk about faithfulness. But let's look together at this, uh, at verse 25. Uh, A few names that Paul has for him. He says, Epaphroditus, my brother. The word brother here is faithful believer, really being united in the bond of affection, not actually biologically related brother or anything. He's just my brother in the Lord. And then later he says, my fellow worker. And this is synergos. And the word here, the idea here is a companion in labor, my coworker, if you will. Later he says, my fellow soldier, an associate in conflict for the cause of Christ. Epaphroditus was willing to go through, who knows how tough that six-week journey was. He got sick. He almost died. And not only that, and I think it's important for us to note here as well, that Christians are engaged in battle. There is an enemy out there who is trying to derail us and make us ineffective and unproductive for the cause of Christ. And for every one of us, we have to be aware that God is on our side. And we may like saying that God is for me and who can be against you. I'll tell you who's gonna, who is against you. It's the devil, it's the enemy. But the thing is, is God stronger than the devil? So we are in a battle. We are soldiers and we can't forget that. We also see Paphroditus called a messenger as well. And this is the same idea as apostle, uh, a delegate, someone who was sent forth just as the apostles were with Jesus uh, a few books earlier. And then the last name we see from uh, about Epaphroditus is he's a minister. Uh, we get the same word like liturgy here, uh, a minister, a servant, someone who's partnering with him. So some really neat things about Epaphroditus, a messenger, a minister of my need. So someone who has, who's mentioned two times in scripture, Paul lists five incredibly faithful things about Epaphroditus. And, and what I really just think about when I'm, when I'm thinking about Epaphroditus, what impacts me, especially in our culture, is I don't need to be awesome. I just need to be faithful. Like in my work here, even in church ministry and counseling stuff as a friend. My job isn't to be awesome and to do whatever I can to be the most awesome guy in the room, but rather to be the most faithful. Jesus wants to change the world and he wants to do that through you. He won't necessarily give you a title to do that under, but it doesn't mean you are any less essential in changing the world that God has put you in. Awesome really is overrated. Faithful is really underrated. So let's try to be faithful. Paphroditus was faithful. He didn't strive to be awesome 
ordinary faithful people who love Jesus, who humbly serve his church and work hard with glad hearts is what God is calling us to be. And what we see Epaphroditus modeling here as well. But before we move on, I want to just note one other word here in, I think it's verse 26. Yeah, verse 26. That's just key that I want to just draw out. It's so powerful. He says, for he has been longing, desiring, he has been longing for you all and has been distressed because you heard that he was ill, which is unique because for us, we can hear that someone has heard bad news about us when we just send them a message. We give them a phone call. We, we maybe drop something in the mail, whatever that may be. Epaphroditus, he found out that the people in Philippi, the church in Philippi, heard he was sick. And when people get sick, then they don't just go over to the ER and get better. When people get sick, they could die because there isn't the medicine like we have today. So they found out he was sick. And Paul's saying, yes, not only was he sick, he was near death. But look at that word there. In verse 26, where he has been distressed because you heard he was ill. The, that word distress shows up only three times in scripture. Two of those times is in Mark and in Matthew. And that word distressed is used only when, G, when Jesus is in the garden of Gethsemane and he is, he's on his need. He's called the three other closest disciples in closer with him. And it says Jesus was distressed there in the garden. There was that weight. The word there distressed is full of heaviness. Full of heaviness is the translation there in the Greek word to be troubled, of great distress, anguish, almost distressed. And so that kind of love, he has been distressed because you heard that. He loved these people and was concerned that they were that worried about him. That, my friends, is character. He wasn't willing to just push them off and say, don't worry about it, they'll be fine. The character in him was not only a messenger, not only a follower of Jesus, not only a soldier and a friend and a brother, but he also had a deep love for the people of God and the emotions of the people of God. To me, that's challenging myself. I wonder how much I am emotionally engaged in the emotions of other people. I'm gonna say that again. How much am I, or how much are you emotionally engaged in the emotions of other people? It's like, like sympathy or empathy on steroids. How much are we engaging in those emotions and how much do we just blow them off to the side? Character says, because they are part of the body of Christ, I want to, as scripture says, weep with those who are weeping and laugh with those who are laughing. That's an incredible kind of character that we see from Epaphroditus. We jump on, we move on to verse 28. Actually, in verse 27, the last phrase there, God had mercy on him, not only on him, but also on me, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. Sorrow, God, uh, Paul gives glory to God for healing him and says, you know, God did a great work there and also saved me from, uh, from sadness, from sorrow. And then verse 28, he says, because God saved him, because of that, I am the more eager to send him to you, therefore. Or some of your Bibles may have the therefore at the beginning of verse 28. When you see therefore, look what it's there for. So because of the fact that God has healed Epaphroditus, Paul's like, God has healed him. God still has a plan for his life. And so because of that, I'm gonna send him back to you that you may, look what it says in verse 28, rejoice at seeing him again and that you will no longer be anxious or so that you will be less anxious. So when he gets there, rejoice, it says in verse 29, in the Lord with joy and honor such men. Why should we honor them? Because of their character. So we see from him, not only because of his character, but look at the, next, the, the last phrase there in 29 and the beginning of 30. He almost died. He was willing to, and this is the fourth point on your outline, he was willing to risk it all. Be willing to risk it all. How much are, am I willing to risk things? How much are you willing to risk things for the cause of Christ? Look at verse 30. It says, for he nearly died for the work of Christ. Risking 
his life to complete what was lacking in your service to me. The first part of that nearly died for the work of Christ. He didn't nearly die for some pet project he was on. He didn't nearly die for an adrenaline rush just to get a high there. He didn't nearly die for anything of his own agenda, but he nearly died for the work of Christ. And it's for that reason and that reason alone that Paul says you should honor such men. He was willing to go to that kind of extent so that the cause of Christ could be pushed forward. Again, the title of our entire series through Philippians, for the sake of the gospel, was willing to do all of those things for the sake of the gospel. This idea that that he was willing to, to do that, it says risking his life, and then it says to complete what was lacking in your service to me. And that's just a unique phrase I just want to touch on briefly. There's two thoughts on that. One, uh, the, the idea of complete what was lacking in your service could be talking about uh, this idea of lacking, depending on your translation. We'll say that Paul's saying, he came in your stead because you couldn't come, because you were lacking in being able to be here emotionally with me, being, I'm sorry, be here physically with me. So that's one thought on that. Uh, my thought is, is something a little bit different because obviously they have a gift. Epaphroditus brought a gift and then now Paul's saying, there was, you were lacking in your service to me. So what's he talking about? I think it's this, that before they sent a gift, they sent him probably with money. Paul runs out of money. They send him more money. So he's saying he, Epaphroditus, came and brought the, the extra money, the, the extra gift that was lacking beforehand in their previous gift to, to Paul. And so what we see here is, is a great love that Epaphroditus not only has for the people in the church, but also for the person who planted that church, and that's Paul. He was willing to risk his life so that that could happen. Asking yourself that question, how much have you risked Maybe you could discuss this afterwards. How much have you risked for the cause of Christ? What have you let die in your life for the cause of Christ? What do you need to risk for the cause of Christ? Is it friends? Is it a job maybe? Family members or, uh, you know, a relationship? Maybe people won't like you as much. What is it today that Christ is asking you to lay down, to risk for the cause and the glory of Christ and the gospel. A lesson that we draw from this, as you see on your outline, is to be someone that God has called us to be, is to be willing to risk it all. John chapter 15, verse 13 says this, greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. Greater love. We see a love that's communicated, even in this passage that seems so simple. And Paul's just like, here's some plans that I have. We see two incredible characters, two ordinary people. We have a Timothy who, yeah, he was taught the Bible early on. He had a dad who wasn't even Bible-believing and God-fearing, and God still used him. You have Epaphroditus who's only mentioned a couple times, but here we see great character attributed to him, an ordinary guy with extraordinary behavior. To bring this full circle, when ordinary collides with extraordinary, what is that going to bring out in our lives? What is that going to bring out in your life? We can have extraordinary, we have extraordinary in the spirit of God living inside of every single one of us. I am an ordinary person with an extraordinary spirit. You as a follower of Jesus are an, ext- an ordinary person with an extraordinary spirit. Ex- spirit. When ordinary and extraordinary collide, you have only the work of God that's gonna come out of that. Only the work of God, only supernatural, extraordinary work comes out of that. When you look at your life and you say, I'm just do an ordinary work as an ordinary person. May I challenge you with this thought? Are you letting the Spirit of God work inside of you as God desires it to? Because I promise you, when the Spirit of God is moving inside of you freely, you're letting go of of all of those hindrances and pointing yourself towards the mission of God, you will do extraordinary things. Maybe that extraordinary work will just happen and be seen in your workplace. Maybe it'll be seen in your family. Maybe it'll be seen with your friends and maybe by 100, 1,000 or 10,000 people. I don't know. Leave that up to God. Let God dictate your plans. But when ordinary people submit themselves to an extraordinary God, extraordinary things happen. 
We live in a, in a challenging time right now. We have an extraordinary God who's given us extraordinary peace, extraordinary peace. Let's live out that extraordinary peace. Let's live out that ex- extraordinary love towards our brothers and sisters in Christ. Let's live out extraordinary love towards the lost people in our life who we are called to be lights to, who desperately need Jesus. Lord, we come before you today uh, just trusting that you uh, will transform our lives. If we submit ourselves to you, we cannot do life by ourselves. Without you, we are just ordinary people lost and wandering. But with you, you've given us the power to do extraordinary work. I pray that you would help each and every one of us to take, even if it's just a small step towards you, so that more extraordinary work can be done through the Spirit that you've given us. In your name I pray, amen. I'm glad that you could join us for this service. We're going to close our time. I'm going to pray. And I just want to encourage you uh, with, with just one thought. If you are watching this and you have not trusted in Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I would encourage you to do that today. Jesus, we're, we're stepping into Easter. Jesus came. He stepped into our world as a seemingly ordinary person, but really was an extraordinary person. 
And we recognize that as not just an extraordinary person, but he is not just a man, he's also God. And he died for us because we are not sufficient enough to take care of our own sin. So he covered that for us. And he promised that if we trust in him, that our sin can be wiped away and we can be forgiven. If you haven't trusted in the name of Jesus to save you from all of your sins, do that today. Reach out to us at, uh, at the church. We'd be glad to, to disciple you, to point you in the right direction, to answer any questions that you have as well. But I'm glad you could join us in this setting. Let's pray. Uh, Lord, we come before you today uh, knowing that you hear us, knowing that you are here with us. I ask that you would transform our lives, that you would teach us more about who you are, that you would give us a peace that surpasses understanding, that you would encourage us when we are down, give us hope for the future. And thank you that we know where our eternity is held. And even while we await that today, we know that we can have security and hope in you because you know us as your children. Bless us and be with us. In your name, Jesus. Amen.